President Westmoreland, and Dean George, distinguished faculty, administration here at Beeson, family and friends who have gathered because of the graduates and honored graduates. What a joy it is for me to be here and what a privilege to speak to such an esteemed group this morning. I'm reminded of the little boy that went into a candy shop. He took all of his allowance and he bought all the candy he could, brought it out in a bag, and outside he prayed, Lord, make my tongue equal to this occasion. And that's how I kind of feel this morning as I stand before you, Lord, make my tongue equal. This is a wonderful opportunity and spirit to be able to speak before you and to share. Graduates, you are concluding one of the best opportunities that are afforded to the men and women of God, and that is theological education. You are blessed to be graduating from one of the most outstanding of divinity schools in our country. In the years ahead, I know that you will appreciate this even more and more as I have appreciated the time that I spent at Southwestern Seminary. I'm not a prophet, nor a son of a prophet, but as it was said of Queen Esther in the Persian Empire in the 5th century, you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And like Daniel in the 6th century BC as a captive in Babylon, he was one who had his faith challenged because of his culture, that pagan culture. And so it will be for you, there will be challenges. But like Daniel and Esther, a young man, a young woman, you will also find that God will be faithful in your unique time as well. Who would have thought that you and I would see in our day nine Supreme Court justices who would be hearing oral arguments on same-sex marriage versus traditional marriage? Their ruling may well redefine legal marriage and thereby disavowing what you and I have known for all of these centuries as biblical marriage. Their possible ruling will not only affect the marriage and family unit that we have come to hold so dear because of God's word, but it's also going to challenge our sacred belief in religious liberty. Coupled with this is the growing anti-Christian sentiment that we find in spirit in our land. Just recently, I saw a political cartoon that characterized that. It was a, a depiction of a number of protesters holding up signs. One sign read, save the owl. Another, save the trees. Another, save the well. Another one, save the polar bear. Another one said, save the planet. But on the ground in a river of blood was a man with a bubble over his head with the words, save the Christians. And yet, I have confidence in you. As God did with Esther, as God did with Daniel, in this unique time, I have no doubt that he's going to lead you to navigate through these treacherous times ahead and these uncharted waters of our own particular unique time. Today, I want to ask you to turn your attention to Timothy as the scripture was read for us a moment ago. He also lived in a time when Christianity was spreading. Paul had given him an assignment. He was to be the, the pastor at the church of Ephesus. And in the very first letter that Paul wrote, that letter was given over to an opportunity for Timothy to be encouraged in the gospel message and to be able to deal with the false teachers that were inflicting themselves upon the church. He was called upon to teach the truth and speak with conviction. One verse earlier that was read for you said, Command and teach these things. And in the Greek, it's a, a durative imperative, which means keep on commanding, keep on teaching these things. All the things that Paul had taught Timothy, he said, these are the things that you need to continue with. So this morning, I want to challenge you to set an example. Set an example for a lifetime because you will have an impact and influence as you minister. Graduates, this generation and the succeeding ones that you're going to be ministering to are in need of authentic men and women who will live out their faith, who truly have been saved by grace, who believe in the word of God, and who are called to serve. Those who will be living in truth and convictions, you will be a model of what a Christ-like life is to be lived, and you live it in love. You'll need a consistent ministry and a lifestyle that will be able to minister to those that are ahead. 
So this morning as we look into the scripture that has already been shared with us, I want us to look at Timothy because the words that Paul shared with Timothy are very applicable to us as an example how to live in our unique time. We're to set an example for a lifetime. And you will find that you will be able to see lives transformed under your influence. First of all, I want you to see there in this uh, passage in verse 12 that there is a reminder to set an example in your public life. Paul says, let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech and conduct and love and faith and purity. He makes mention of let no one despise your youth. That word youth had to deal with someone maybe up to age 40. It is surmised that, that Timothy probably was around the age of 35. But he said, let no one despise the youth. Maybe Paul was understanding that there was some pushback for this young man, Timothy. That maybe some of the elders in the church, some of the leaders may have pushing, pushing him because of his young age and his lack of experience. Maybe Timothy was even complaining a little bit about that very thing in his own life. Maybe there was some actions that uh, caused the people to be a little bit critical. But Paul says, let no one despise. That word despise means let no one hold you in contempt. Let no one hold you back from the authority of serving as God's man, as God's servant. So Paul answers as he says, not let this to happen. He said, set before them an example. Set the believers an example. In other words, show your maturity. Show how close you are to the Lord Jesus Christ. The word set is an intention. You intentionally set the example. The example he is speaking of is being a model. Be such that they will want to copy you. Be a pattern for them. Be the, the model of what a true believer in Jesus Christ is supposed to be. And recognize that your testimony will be powerful in their sight. Then Paul lists those areas. It's not an exhaustive list, but it's a representative of list of where we need to be in our walk as we demonstrate publicly what is in our hearts privately. First he says, in speech, whether it be private, whether it be public, let your communication always be pleasant, let it always be wholesome. Recognize that your speech is a reflection of your heart. In Matthew chapter 12 it says, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. What will your heart be full of when someone criticizes you? Well, you need to, uh, ahead of time, learn how to control that and watch your thoughts as well. I can remember many times sitting in my office, and as I was working on a sermon, I began to think, you know, I hope this person is here Sunday so they'll hear what I've got to say. And you know, the Lord has a sense of humor. That person wouldn't even be there that Sunday. But it was reminding of me, I better be careful in speech. Also, you want to be an example in your conduct. To understand that your actions are to model righteous living. That your behavior is to reflect, to reflect what God would have in his servant. Your convictions without hypocrisy. I can still remember a pastor in my hometown in Melbourne, Florida. How that he was known for his anger and for his poor sportsmanship. Because he played softball in the church softball team. And he behaved in a way that was unbecoming of a minister. I think Paul had that in mind. Watch our conduct. He also says, be an example in your love, in words as well as your deeds. Paul, all the way through those letters of his, demonstrated what it meant to love and to give sacrificially to the church. And can I give you just a, a warning by an older pastor? Our day, when we have all the electronic devices, wonderful aids and tools in ministry, but it will never take the place of the eye to eye. It will never take the place of the touch. Let me give you an example. Just a few weeks ago, one of our members had talked to me and, and needed one of our younger staff to come see their daughter. And so I let that staff member know that he needed to make a contact there. Well, he, made a, he did a text because he had been texting with this young lady before, but he did a text. And the mother called and said, that really wasn't enough. I took that staff member, we made an appointment, and we went to the house. And it was a teaching lesson for that staff member about the importance of eye to eye, the touch. And while our electronic devices will help us in wonderful ways, never fail to understand the love is in action and in the deeds of the personal touch and the lives of those that you minister. You're to be an example in your faith. 
That's more than just what you believe, our body of belief. It's talking about being faithful, being faithful to the church, being faithful to the gospel, being faithful to people. You're to find yourself faithful. And then he also says, be an example in your purity. In purity, he is speaking specifically of sexual behavior. And the reason for this that he wants to make sure that is named is Satan knows our vulnerabilities, and especially in a world that we find ourselves in, that we need to be careful and always above reproach in our actions, in our thought lives. Let us always be careful. Now, I want to challenge you that you may be young, you may feel like you're inexperienced, so be careful when it says, let no one despise your youth. That doesn't mean you're to get angry or to come back by being manipulative concerning someone or finding yourself uh, just somewhat dealing in an inappropriate way, maybe gossiping about that person that's showing contempt towards you. No, you show Christ-likeness. You show it in your speech, in your conduct, in your love, in your faith, and in purity. And you will be amazed at those that you will win over because they'll have confidence because you have been an example in your behavior, in your public life. Paul goes on to say, you need to also be an example in your pastoral ministry. He says in verse 13, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Now, Paul was traveling, and, and he said, until I come, you need to do this. Devote yourself. Pay attention. Make sure you concentrate on your, on your duties. And then he names them. Public reading of the Scripture, that would have been the Old Testament, that would have been letters. Exhortation, that would have been the preaching of the Word for decision, for transformation. It would have been teaching, teaching the new converts. All of this would have been important in Timothy's day. And I want to remind you that this is a principle because you say, well, that's not what I will be doing. You have other callings that God has, has already delivered to you. But the principle is still the same. Give attention, devote yourself. When I came right out of seminary, I went to First Baptist Church in Gulf Breeze. I was the associate pastor. I had multiple responsibilities. But I remember after I got my desk, all the way I wanted my desk, I sat there a day or two. I said, now what do I do? My first assignments, they didn't train me for that in seminary, those first assignments that I had. And then I learned that my ministry would be broad to have to cover lots of responsibilities. Then, because I had earned the right, I would be able to do the calling, the passion, some of those things that I really felt I was gifted for. So notice what Paul says, do not neglect the gift that you have, which was given to you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Do not neglect is a command because every one of us were gifted at the moment of our salvation. And we may have one spiritual gift, two or three. But that gift for ministry God gave you, he gave it to you through the Holy Spirit to be exercised in the church. And recognize that while you may have other duties, don't let the church work take the place of the work of the church that he's called you specifically to do as part of the body of Christ and as a leader. So do not do, do not give up that, do not neglect, do not take it for granted or be careless with the gift that God has given you for ministry. I am so thankful as I read what Paul said about Timothy. People recognized it. God's people recognized Timothy's gift. And then the leaders of the church gave him the authority by ordination, gave him the authority to do it. I remember the cherished thought of my home church and being just a, a young student, a, a junior higher, and then a, up to high school, but then people began to recognize there's something about Travis. There's something that they believe God was going to do and used. And it was through their encouragement as God was forming out the calling in my own life, fashioning that, people encouraged me to keep on. And then my blessed mother continued to pray and was there. And then the leaders of the church put their hands on me to confirm what God was already doing. They were just giving their blessing what God had already started in my life. So we want to be an example for a lifetime in your pastoral ministry or whatever special ministry you have lastly you need to also set an example in a lifetime for personal responsibility for Paul goes on to say in the passage practice these things that word practice there is an athletic term many of you grew up in sports whether as a child or a youth maybe as young adults you you've been involved you know what it is to practice you know what it is because practice 
leads to improvement. Practice makes perfect. If you want to preach and teach, you got to preach and teach. And I'm so thankful for the churches, especially those first two, in Gulf Breeze as associate enterprise as, a, as the pastor, because those sermons in Gulf Breeze and at least half of those in enterprise, I've never even preached in Prattville, and there's a reason for that. But God has matured me and grown me, and I learned something from my seminary pastor, Lloyd Elder. I remember hearing him say, just a brief comment, Saturdays he was at the church practicing a sermon. And I got to think, if that was good enough for that man who pastored a great church, went on to what we knew then as the Baptist Sunday School Board, Travis Coleman ought to pay attention to that. And to this day, my 41st year in ministry, I'm still at the church sometime on Saturday. My wife will tell you, usually twice on Saturday, just practicing the sermon. Why? Because practice makes perfect. Not to, not to be always perfect in speech or whatever, but to let God's word sink into my heart in his house and to minister to me and to be able to share that message. I take it seriously. He says, immerse yourself in them. He says, find yourself absorbed. And when he says them, practice these things and immerse yourself in them, he's talking about the fact that whether it be your speech, your conduct, whether it be your love, whether it be your faith, whether it be purity, whether it be public reading of Scripture or exhortation or teaching or whatever your special ministry will be, immerse yourself in them. Give yourself to them. And he tells us why, so that, you may, so that they may see your progress. That word progress is a military term. Soldiers go out and they prepare the way for people to follow. And so the church needs to see your progress in spiritual growth. They need to see your progress in ministry, ministry effectiveness. And in doing so, they are going to be willing to follow you. And that's your personal responsibility to do that. So graduates, show those that you will influence. Show them what it means to have a walk with God in Bible study and prayer. Show them what it means to have a strong marriage and family. Show them what it is to have godly children. Show them what it means to have a proper Christian stewardship of finances and material possessions. Show them what it is for a Christian to endure crisis, illness, and even the death of loved ones. Now, you're not going to be perfect at it. None of us are. But remember, the one who we love and follow is perfect. And we are to grow in the image of Jesus Christ. Therefore, they want to see your progress because that gives them encouragement to follow after you. So you have that personal responsibility. Now, Paul sums it up in verse 16. Keep a close watch. Why? Because Satan wants to bring down his servants. Satan wants to attack you because if he can cause you to fall, he knows all the people you influence, you impact. It will discourage them from going on. So keep a watch on yourself, and it says, and your doctrine. Meaning, take stock of who you are and what you believe. Because each affects your relationship with God. Paul had this in mind, I believe, 1 Corinthians 9, 27. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave, so after I have preached to others, I myself may not be disqualified for the prize. Paul was disciplined. He took personal responsibility because he didn't want to be disqualified with God or being a servant of God. And so you too need to take on that personal responsibility lest you lose your own ministry. And then he gives the final word, persist in this, meaning never give up, for by doing so you will save yourself and your hearers. He's not talking about salvation. He's not saying you're going to save people in salvation. He said you're going to save them from spiritual shipwreck. You're going to save them from spiritual bad health. You will help them to avoid the consequences and the headaches of sin and terrible decision-making. They're watching you. Again, your progress. So take personal responsibility, and God will honor it. So you are to set an example for a lifetime in your public life and your pastoral ministry and your personal responsibility. And I've got great confidence that you, the 2015 May graduating class of Beeson School of Divinity, that you will do that. You will honor our God 
and you will make this school proud that you are part of the graduating class. Let me share an illustration in closing. It's a story about a young man named William Borden. William graduated from Chicago High School in 1904. He was already a millionaire because his family were the Borden Dairy folks, and he was going to be inheriting that estate. But for his graduation, high school graduation gift, he was given the gift of a trip around the world. And so he visited all of the places you could only imagine that were available in 1904. But while he was out in Europe and Asia and the Middle East, he saw hurting people, people full of burdens. And it was in that year of travel that God called him to be a missionary. And he gave his life to missionary preparation. And so he entered Yale University in the fall of 1905. There, with his passion for Christ, he quickly recognized there was moral bankruptcy at that school and that the teaching was more around empty philosophy than anything. He began to pray. A student joined him. A third joined him. His freshman year, there were 150 students joining him in prayer and Bible study every week. By his graduating year, 1909, 1,000 of the 1,300 students of Yale University were in Bible study and prayer meetings along with William Borden. He would write in his Bible these words, no reserve as he entered the school. But at graduation, he was inundated with a number of job re uh, requests for, for him to come and work for a number of companies. But he was not going to be undaunted about his call in ministry. So he wrote again in his Bible, no retreat, no reserve, no retreat. He would enter Princeton University, receive a degree, he felt God calling him to minister to the Muslims in China. He set sail for China, but on his way, he stopped in Egypt, there to study Arabic. Within a few months, he contracted spinal meningitis, and at the age of 25, he died. His family and friends found in his Bible two more words. No reserve, no retreat, no regrets. And what a comfort it was to family and friends. I challenge you. As you understand you are to set an example for a lifetime in your public ministry and your pastoral calling and, and your personal responsibility, let there be no reserve and let there be no retreat and let there never be any regrets as you follow God's plan for your life. Thank you, graduates.